And this is, again, the familiar story of the woman at the well. When the disciples came back, they were shocked to find him, Jesus, talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? So I'm going to stop there because that gave me such a visual. If you can just imagine with me, the disciples are just having a conversation amongst themselves and they're laughing and talking like, man, I wonder what Jesus is going to do today. You know, he'd be doing these miracles and having a good time. And then all of a sudden they come up and they see Jesus talking to this woman and they like, oh, can you imagine their faces? Just the shock. The, the Bible actually says they were shocked to find him talking to her but they didn't have the nerve to say what was on their mind. Now, how many of you all know that sometimes people don't have to say the words because their actions scream so much louder than their words. And it tells you exactly what, what they are thinking. So when I read that line and it said, why are you talking to her? It just hit me differently because whether someone has verbally posed the question or it just is a thought in their head, the question represents the struggle that conf has confronted so many women for centuries. In this Women's History Month, as we celebrate the great women who have gone before us and have left their mark in history, I couldn't help but think about all of the women who were elevated to great positions of power and significance and influence and the women who broke those very thick glass ceilings in their industry and field. And just like that woman at the well, when people saw them in that position, they thought to themselves, why are you talking to her? Because this question is more than just a question. It represents a belief, a belief that says, I don't think you belong here. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you're worthy of being in this position of influence. You're talking to the Messiah. You don't, you're not worthy to have this conversation with him. In other words, I don't believe that your voice matters. Saints, one thing that we must remember, that one of the most powerful vehicles that God gave us on this earth was the power of our voice. And that is something that we see time and time again, people trying to take away from us. When we look at Genesis 1, verse 26 to 28, that Reverend Veronica has spoke of earlier, that God created us in his image, often referred to as the Imago Dei. And in Psalms 29, verse four through eight, the psalmist tells us that God's voice is powerful full of majesty, striking like lightning bolts. And if we're created in the image of God, the one whose voice has not been silenced since the beginning of time, then we too need to be reminded of the power of our voice. A person's voice represents their personhood. It's literally an extension of themselves. And when we have our voice taken away, we suffer significant loss. Our voice also re represents our power and authority here on earth. When we look back to the story in the garden with Adam, one of the first things that God asked Adam to do was use his voice to name the creatures on earth as a reflection of his dominion. So when someone tries to silence our voice, they are attempting to take away the power that God has bestowed upon us. Satan is very aware of this. 
And he often tries to discourage us. He often tries to silence our voices to steal our power. And that's why this woman's story is so significant. This woman at the well, which as a side note, I find it so interesting that she never, we never found out her name. So we can easily relate to her story and see ourselves in her story. The struggle that she had to face, the struggle that represents all the struggle of so many women who have gone before her. It represents the resistance that women had to endure the barriers of entry that women had to break down in order to have their voices heard. So for the rest of our time together, I want to spend some time reflecting on the different ways in which the enemy tries to silence our voices. The first way in which the enemy tries to, to silence us is through systems. If we look at the time in which the woman at the well was living in. There was a belief that women should be seen, but you know the rest, not heard. There were customs and laws in place that reinforced this belief. Women didn't have the right to choose. In fact, they were more so treated like property, who if they were married, it was their prim primary responsibility to care for the needs of their husband and have their children. But women at the time, they didn't have the right to divorce a man. No, that would be giving them too much power. That would be giving them choice. But men, they could divorce a woman for any reason. If you weren't able to bear a child, if you couldn't keep the house to their satisfaction, if you couldn't cook well, if, if you just looked at him the wrong way, then he could choose to divorce you. You didn't have voice as a woman in the marriage. And if you try to use your voice, there were systems in place to silence you. Gender roles were enforced. Systems were in place that said that you need to stay in your lane and do what you're told and don't rock the boat. Systems have been used to oppress and silence voices of women throughout history. But women continued to fight against those systems. Even over the last century, women had to continue to fight for the right to vote, the right for public office, the right for fair wages, the right to have a seat at the table, and if they didn't wanna sit at the table, a right to make their own. And so women had to fight, like Susan B. Anthony, Ida B. Wells, the Mary Church Terrells of the world, fought against systems designed to silence us. These women knew that if they didn't fight to change these systems designed to suppress our voices, then our livelihood and well-being would continue to be at the mercy of someone who thought our lives weren't significant. And that's why so many women were willing to sacrifice their entire life to break down these systems of oppression. But even with laws changing and women continuing to break glass ceilings like the one that was shattered in January when we swore in our new Madam Vice President. We still are met with resistance because don't you fall for the okie doke as they say. Don't you believe for one second that if laws change, it has the ability to change hearts. Those are not one and the same. There are still people who believe that when we are in the boardroom speaking, when we're having those conversations with presidents of nations, they're silently thinking to themselves, why are you talking to her? This question we still fight against. And the reality is there are people who we encounter in our lives, whether man or woman who believes that our voice does not matter and we don't deserve a seat at the table. And we have to learn, and this is the second point I wanna point out to you, that people will also try to silence our voices by hijacking our personal narrative. They want to define us by putting us in this tiny little box that they construct 
based on our circumstances, based on our past, or just based on their limited beliefs about us. They try to construct a narrative to dim our light, to cover up our God-given gifts that neglects the Imago day that is in us. And this woman, she understood this struggle all too well. She was very familiar with people trying to define her by her circumstances, by her past. First off, this woman was a Samaritan woman. And at that time, Samaritan women were considered dirty from birth. So she already had that working against her. And if you're familiar with the story, the woman actually had gone through five marriages and the sixth one was not even thought to be her husband. And like I mentioned before, if you weren't able to satisfactorily do your job as a, a wife, then something was wrong with you. But this begs the question, none of us were in that household to know what was going on. We don't know why that marriage did not work out. Again, a man at that time could leave a woman for anything. And so I'm just imagining what people were trying to say about this woman, the whispers of, oh, you know, she can't keep a man. Mm, something's wrong with her. You know, I heard she did that, right? Mm, all, you know how folks can be, even church people can be sometimes. And so the whispers got her to the point where she just didn't even want to be bothered with people anymore. She just went to the well at a time of day where she knew no one would be present because she didn't even want to engage the world because why does it matter? People already cast me out. They think they know me. My voice doesn't matter. There was a weight that this woman was carrying. And that's a weight that we all carry when people try to tell us who we are and what we're capable of. When people try to silence our voice by hijacking our stories and attempting to define us when they don't even know us. When people try to paint a narrative because of the neighborhood that we come from, the school that we attended, saying that we're not qualified because of the fact that we came from a single family home or we experienced abuse in childhood or we never went to college or we've been divorced or because of the color of our skin or because of the fact that we're merely a woman. They say that we're disqualified to live out our God-given purpose. The devil is a lie. These toxic narratives are thrown upon us, designed to weigh us down and silence our voices. But we must fight against it. And thankfully, we witnessed something happen in this woman's story. When she was at the well, on that hot day, Jesus approached her and told her, I know that you're a Samaritan woman. I know about all the stuff in your love life, but I don't care about all that because I wanna redirect your focus to your eternal purpose. See, that's the thing. Some of us are so distracted by these systems that are against us, by the narrative that people tell us when people tell us what we can and cannot do, we're so discouraged that we're distracted from our eternal purpose. And Jesus came to tell her that day, I know all these years you value how you value yourself, what you put your attention to has all been focused around the opinion of others. You've been drinking this water of the world that's tried to define you. And each and every time you've come up dry. But I'm going to tell you about a living water where you never have to thirst again. And in John 4, 23, he tells her, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshiper that the Father seeks. And then he goes on to say in verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. He was telling her in that moment, shift your focus, daughter. Shift your focus. It needs to be you living out your purpose, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And Jesus revealed himself to her that, that day as the Messiah. And in that moment, something happened to her. 
I believe in that moment, she recognized that this false narrative that she believed about herself for all these years, that she was not good enough, that she didn't belong, that she was a mistake, that she was not qualified, was put to rest. Because the one who qualifies all of us, Jesus Christ, revealed to her that day her purpose, and she didn't need the approval of anybody else to do it. And I'm here to tell you the same thing. You don't need the approval of anybody else to live out your God-given purpose. And so that day, that woman, before this encounter, this woman who didn't speak to anybody, who had isolated herself, who thought she lost her voice, all of a sudden found her voice again. And she was ready to proclaim to the world, you will not silence my voice. I have something to say. And she began to proclaim the news boldly to everybody, letting everyone know what Jesus did for her that day. And as we read later in that story, that woman went on to save many lives. And I believe too many of us have allowed the pressures of the world to silence our voices. Silenced by family secrets, silenced by toxic narratives thrown on us by society, silenced by systems designed to keep us distracted, discouraged, and defeated, silenced by that unspoken question that continues to fight against us every day that says, why are you talking to her? But we have to learn to stand up and fight and understand the power that lies in our voices. We can't afford to remain silent in this world that's flooded with hatred, injustice, and is crying out for light. Our voices need to be heard in this time, in these last days. So I am telling you, just like Jesus told that woman at the well that we are all called for an eternal purpose. Everyone has a role to play in this. Your voice matters. Do not let anybody silence your voice ever again. Live out your God-given purpose. The world is waiting on you. Amen.